Well, hello, Conrad Anker, uh, the mountain climber extraordinaire, the man who discovered the body of George Mallory, who died on Mount Everest in 1924, and it was in 1999 that you discovered Mallory's body? That's correct. It was a specific expedition in 99 to look for the body of George Mallory. Who yeah. was a British explorer and was, he was not the first person to attempt the to conquer Everest, was he? He wasn't the first to summit and make it back safely, but there's a chance he and his partner, Sandy Urban, might have made it to the top in 1924, 29 years before Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay did in 1953. And he, Edmund Hillary, of course, is got the reputation as the man, the first man to conquer Everest. Yes. And so you, how many years after your discovery of Mallory's body did you recreate his expedition, including the clothing and the rope that was tethered between him and Sandy Irwin with your climbing partner, and try to duplicate those conditions to see if Mallory could indeed have gotten up to Everest and died on the way down. This is told in the National Geographic film Everest, The Wildest Dream, and that of course is a quote from Susan Mallory's letter that's quoted at the end, yes? The wildest dream. Yeah. So we um, came back in 2007 working with Anthony Geffen from the UK to make a biopic about the life of George Mallory, include a contemporary climb of Mount Everest, and do as much of it as possible in period clothing and equipment. So we used the leather boots, the woolen knickers, the oiled cotton gabardine jackets, and seven layers, I understand, of clothing. Yeah, just be all bundled up and then moving uh, slower and, and with more precision than what one can climb with modern equipment. Hobnailed boots? That was the <laughs> yeah. weirdest thing. Yeah, imagine hobnail boots, uh, a, a thin leather boot that you'd probably hike around in the forest with, with sort of the equivalent of soccer cleats embedded onto the bottom. And uh, so it's a real different type of, uh, a different type of setup. So. Well, Conrad, to go back a little bit, um, mountain climbing in... George Mallory's day, the 20s, Liam Neeson, the narrator, says, were the last great era, decade of exploration. Uh, Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic yeah. with his solo flight. Uh, people, there were still uncharted areas of the world that people wanted to see. And yet, today, it's a whole kind of different thing. When did you become interested in mountain climbing? I started out at a young age. I was introduced to it by my parents. Uh, I'm from Central California and uh, outside of Yosemite Valley, so I was rock climbing oh, at age 14. So I'm 47 now, and I still, if, you know, if I wasn't here, I'd be out climbing on some rocks. Well, but, when uh, is there a thing of fear of heights that you have to overcome, or is this just part of a, a climber's DNA that you can't be afraid of heights if you're going to be a rock climber? You, you, you might become, it, it might be something you become accustomed to, but if you're, um, if, if it's something that doesn't do well, doesn't bode well, then you're probably not going to do it, but it's amazing. You look at a child and they just scamper around in trees and on jungle gyms, and so they're a little more cognizant of exposure and risk and things like that, and yet they're having fun. Well, I remember seeing the Philippe Petit documentary about him walking on the rope yes. between the World Trade Centers, and for myself, sitting in the theater, when they got to the top of the World Trade Center and looked down, I was ready to fall over in my yeah. seat. I mean, it's just, and but they showed him as a child in the backyard, and he was just fearless, and we yeah. know in movies, Angelina Jolie will do stunts being dropped from a 38th floor on a little uh, rope, yeah. and she has no fear of heights. So it, it does seem to be one of the components that you really yes. need. Yeah, you have to be able to embrace that. Now, one of the things that's brought up in the movie is a few months after your discovery of Mallory's body with your hiking partner, Alex Lowe, you were caught in an avalanche in the Himalayas, and Alex was killed. And you, we see in the photo, look like you were nearly killed. You're bleeding and your head has got a smashed in and you look semi-conscious. Uh, what does that do to you in terms of being able to go back up on a mountain? Is death something you just never think about? And if it happens, you just go back uh, like falling off a horse. You've got to go back and do it or you'll never do it again. 
It, it, I think it varies individual. Um, so yeah, I took some time off from climbing after the tragedy in 1999. It uh, certainly changed my life. and I was fortunate to um, find love with Jenny and be able to care for the kids. And you married his widow yeah. and you adopted four children? Three boys. Three boys, so yeah. that they would have a father, you said. That was yeah. as important as marrying. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great, um, we have a great family, it's a great story. But it's also the connection that climbers have. It runs pretty deep because it really is the ultimate team sport. So Alex and I, we were watching out for each other while we were on the mountains. And it extends beyond just being on the mountains. So when you play tennis, you're, it's against another human, but when you're in the mountains or sailing across the oceans, it's that primal connection to exploration which humans have had since we began being cognizant of our own existence. So plugging back into that. <laughs> well, one of the interesting things when you found Mallory's body was how well preserved everything that he had in his pockets was. There was no real deterioration, it seemed. Now, there's a shot of you there with this figure face down in the snow wearing this outfit with the leg extended, the bare yeah. leg. Is that a recreation? That's a recreation. So it was a... Um mannequin that was uh, made and it was shot uh, on a blue screen and then that's pieced into an actual camera location that's at the vicinity of where George Mallory's body is resting. And because Mallory had told his wife Susan, when Ruth. I get... Ruth. Yes, Susan is the granddaughter. Susan is the granddaughter. Susan Robertson is in the film granddaughter. Ruth Mallory is, is, was the widow of George Mallory. When he told Ruth, he had her picture, and he said, when I get to the top of Everest, I'm going to leave your picture on the mountain. Yeah. And because that was not found on him, that's where this theory began, that he may have died on the way down of a compound fracture. Yes. And I think they said he died probably within a half an hour after. Yeah, yeah whether or not the, the, cam or the, the photograph of his wife, I mean, it's, it makes for a great story, but it's not proof one way or another as they made it to the summit. And what we were able to show in the film is after climbing the second step, a cliff band at 28,300 feet, that it could have been possible for Mallory and Irvin to have summited in 1924. Because, one, you made it up and you made it down. One of the other things you had to do was, since 1975, is it, the Sherpas had a, uh, uh, nailed a ladder into the uh, mountain uh, right under the big uh, sheer face of a rock right under the summit of Everest. Yeah. And that was removed for your climb because yeah. obviously it wasn't there in 1924. It wasn't there when Hillary went up. Oh, he went up from the south side. Oh, okay. Different route. Oh, so, okay. The Chinese climbed it the first time in 1960. They came back in 1975. And in 1975, they installed the ladder. 1980, they opened up the north side of Mount Everest um, as relations were normalized with China in 1980. So tourists started coming, and within that, the, the climbers within the tourists started climbing in 1980 from the north side. So it's been now 30 years that this ladder's been in place. We pulled it away to have a go at it um, in a more natural, pristine setting and to see what Mallory would have encountered on that fateful day of June 8, 1924. Um, when people first propose this, let's have you duplicate this with your climbing partner with a rope, a slender rope, and that's all. Forget about um, down, forget about the engineering that we've got in the 21st century. I mean, did you initially think this is just too crazy of a stunt? We, yeah, we we didn't <laughs> use the period clothing to the summit. We, we climbed in modern day equipment, which really makes a tremendous difference. It makes it you're warmer and you're safer. So we maybe toyed with the idea for a week or two, and then we realized that um, certain things like your footwear, um, I wasn't going to compromise what's available to use period boots. And um, so... So we...